Hey, everyone. Hi, good morning. Welcome. Let's give it another minute or so here, um, just for anyone who might be a straggler to make it. Zena, does that fly by you? Yeah. Okay. All right, and we're in the care plan implementation breakout room. So she mentioned if the that does not sound familiar to you <laughs> or what you thought you were getting into. <laughs> We'd love for you to stay, but yeah, if that is what you right. signed up for, then you can opt to move back to the main room. And it looks like we've got a pretty solid group of people here. So let's jump in. Um, so Zena and I are really excited to be your, your hostesses and moderators of this session this morning slash afternoon and evening, depending on where you are. Again, I'm Rebecca Shear. I'm the Associate Director of Patient Experience at the Live Strong Cancer Institutes. We are the Clinical Cancer Center right here at University of Texas at Austin. And we're an academic medical center and our partner in philanthropy is Live Strong Foundation. Um, so we're really excited to be um, involved in co-hosting this discussion today about care plan implementation around psychosocial or emotional, mental, and behavioral health support. And um, I'll let Zena introduce herself as well. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Zena. Uh, I am based in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I am a senior trainer for the past six years with a nonprofit called Vital Hearts. We are also a grant recipient from the Live Strong Foundation. And our organization offers secondary trauma and resiliency trainings to people who work in fields of high emotional trauma, high emotional demand. So that means care providers, staff at hospitals, chaplains, first responders, victims advocates, people that work in addiction treatment, um, uh, homelessness, and the, the list goes on and on. Um, so that's what Vital Hearts does. I'm also a licensed professional counselor, and I specialize in working with providers and professionals under the lens of mindfulness and embodied well-being. Um, so caring for people who care for others is very much my passion. Uh, and, and personally, I am a part of the rare disease community and have been a patient advocate, writer, speaker there for years as well. So we have a nice, um, a sizable but small workable group with us this morning, and we would love to get to know a little bit about all of you. So is everyone familiar with the chat function in Zoom? Yes, I'm getting nods and thumbs up. Okay, if you are okay with that, go ahead then and drop into the chat box uh, your name, because I think we're all here, but if you have a preferred name, um, and your location. We know not everybody is in Austin like we are. And then what is your connection to cancer? Are you a patient, a survivor, a loved one, um, a provide, you know, a, a caregiver provider, um, informal provider, a researcher, sort of whatever your connection to cancer is so that we can get a better sense of who's here. And we can give a quick look and see uh, who we've got here as we open the conversation. Awesome, Jesse. All right. NYC. Coming. Yes. Nice. KK, good to see you. Oh, awesome. Amy. Patient advocacy. All right, Amy. Awesome. Another New Yorker, Kelly, great. Yeah, grant writing, okay. Four-time cancer survivor, wow, Pamela, awesome. Living through figs of it. A 10-year survivor, tell you, that's amazing. Cancer doula, oof, oof, love that. Sandy, good to see you. Nares Foundation, all right. Clarksville, Maryland. We're from all over the place today, you guys. 
This is awesome. This is awesome. A lot of survivors who are also involved in cancer treatment care foundations creation. Wow, this is really, I feel so honored to be in this room with you all. Debbie from CSC, beautiful, incredible organization. And Tiffany. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, a, a support with your mom, who's a cancer survivor, all right. Awesome, beautiful. So we have a pretty diverse dynamic group of people here today. And if you joined late, just a quick overview of what our goal is today. So this is a follow-up conversation from the Live Strong Icon Summit that happened in October. And that theme, as Suzanne mentioned, was on addressing the stigma of mental health in cancer care. And there were a few key ideas that emerged from that conversation several months ago. One of which was this idea that when a patient is newly diagnosed, they can be set up with care teams and appointments. And that all of these processes are normal in the pathway of cancer, but often what is not included or required as the standard of care are recurring sessions with someone who is a psychosocial provider or a mental or behavioral health uh, specialist. So like a, a therapist, a social worker, or other healthcare provider focused on mental health and well-being. And so the idea emerged that we wanna figure out a way to implement and normalize this part of care into every phase of the cancer continuum and the cancer journey, and not just for the patient, but also for the family members as well. And so our goal today over the next hour or so is to take that key idea and to flesh it out into a well-constructed concept so that Live Strong Foundation can then fund potential pilot projects to address this unmet need. So what you're doing here today with us is really helping us think through and design an opportunity to address this gap. And then Live Strong is going to hopefully at some point soon open up a funding opportunity for nonprofits or individuals or agencies to then respond and say, okay, we have an idea of how we can solve for that problem in mental health and cancer care, we are going to launch a fill in the blank, right? So um, remembering again that, that your input today is helping us to design a critical initiative. Um, so please do bring your experience, your insights, your creativity, the bigger, the bolder, the better. And um, we do encourage everyone to participate as they want. We're a casual group here. So um, if you want to turn your camera on, that's awesome. If you have cats or kids or stuff happening in the background, I've got a little background noise here that I am apologize for, but working through it. Um, so if you also are not comfortable with that, we totally understand everyone is zoomed out, but um, no formal need to, to feel like you have to put on uh, pretenses with us. You can turn your camera on and be in your pajamas, you guys. That works. Um, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to totally. Zina. Um, beautiful. And uh, we'll get started. Okay, awesome. So um, uh, thank you so much for that, Lena and Becca. Um, <clears throat> so we really, again, are encouraging you to be authentic in this, to really trust your voices, your wisdom and personal experience, as well as so many of you, it sounds like, are involved in grant writing, founding things, being part of foundations um, and, and care and research as well. So um, in order to kind of just land ourselves here for a moment, we thought it might be uh, fun to just take a quick, maybe two minutes to do a little grounding, a little centering. And um, because this is what we hope to bring <laughs> into cancer treatment more, right? So why not start with now and uh, do it here together in, in this room? So um, if you're willing to go on a little experience just for about two minutes with me, uh, I, I'd welcome it. Um, so if it feels okay for you, you can, close your eyes or lower your eyes. You can also keep them open, whatever feels most comfortable for you. But we're just gonna take a moment to turn ourselves inward. Okay, so just allow yourself to feel what you're sitting on, the ground beneath you. Just noticing how you're held up in this moment, how you're supported literally by the earth in this moment. There's nowhere else to be, nothing else to do, but be right here right now with yourself and with us. Just connecting to your breath. What does your breath feel like today? You just be curious and say hi to 
our breath in this moment, a source of vitality for our whole system. Connecting to a place that feels core or center for you. And if you will, for just a moment, imagine bringing into your body right here, right now, the awareness of feeling fully supported and cared for. Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. What that feel like? What does that feel like to just imagine almost being wrapped in a blanket of holistic support in your journey? Just leaning into that for a moment, just noticing what your breath feels like, what your body feels like as you imagine that quality holistic support, integrated support for all of you. All of you gets to be here, all of you gets to show up, all of you gets to be held and seen. Really trusting in your experience, your wisdom, your center. And there we're gonna take one nice big inhale and exhale breath. Really land this feeling. Now, as you're ready, you can maybe give a little wiggle, a little stretch, a little movement, whatever feels juicy for your system. You can start to open your eyes, take in the literal physical space around you and also the other people that are collaborating on this journey today. I'm inviting you to keep that connection to yourself, your voice, your wisdom, what you know, and bring that forward so we can really dream together with each other here today. Okay. All right, and with that, uh, let's get into this big hairy question, okay? Which is, how do we help healthcare systems to build cancer experience that offers continuous integrated psychosocial support throughout this whole arc of the cancer journey for patients, for loved ones, for providers, for systems. Okay, so that's a, it's a big question. So we're gonna break it down a little bit and start with what's right here, right now, get a little bit of a snapshot or a temperature of the present moment. Meaning for you, you know, we'd love to hear some of you share what, is working, what's not working, <laughs> you know, working, not working for how psychosocial care is currently being delivered in cancer centers or in this cancer journey? Like what's been your experience on this front? And again, we're informal, so you can just raise a literal hand or pop off my, hey, Karen. Hi, um, I'm gonna speak as a cancer survivor and then I'll speak as what I'm doing. Great. Um, so as a cancer survivor, I um, went through my journey in 2012. Um, I had head and neck cancer and so left me with disfigurement. So I was very um, taken back by the fact that there was not really support for me um, out there. You would go to cancer survivor support groups, but it didn't really address the changes of like your, your image, you know, your facial mm -hmm. disfigurement, so to speak. Um, it talked about other issues, which I'm not saying they're not important. It just did not really leave me a platform or an opportunity to really connect and figure out how to navigate through having a changed face or a changed body. Mm. So, with that being said, I'm a nurse and I um, also did case management previously um, for hospitals. And then I also did case management in insurance companies. And at the time I was working for an insurance company, so I actually had lost my job. So then I had to navigate through all that mess. And luckily, because of my um, professional experience, I was able to navigate through my journey of case, you know, using my case management skills, mm -hmm. advocating for myself, doing my own discharge plans, um, <laughs> you know, basically finding the doctors because my cancer was missed for like 10 months. So 
um, you know, researching and doing all these things for myself. Um, also navigating the financial journey um, for many of us face. Um, my mm -hmm. mortgage company was trying to, you know, kick me out of my house and foreclose. And it was just very, it was a nightmare. So like I, because of my experience as a case manager, I've been able to get through that. But again, still the emotional piece was not something um, I went to counselors and they would ask you to, to talk. And I was still having trouble processing the fact, one, that I was now through cancer, but now having to navigate or process the fact that now I have disfigurement mm -hmm. and everything that I compiled in my life puzzle up to that point, And I was 47 when this happened, mm. um, it all, is all gone. Like I was grieving things like my job, but I no longer had, I was grieving the relationship that I had with my son. Um, at the time he was seven. So like all these things that I had so carefully orchestrated over those years are now mm -hmm. gone. So um, with that all being said, I was struggling and I was depressed for a year and a half. And I'm sorry for being emotional. Um, and I found this huge gap for individuals um, dealing with disfigurement, for facial and body disfigurement. And so I founded an organization called Face-to-Face -face Healing. And um, with COVID-19, we pivoted to actually include all cancer patients. Before we were doing disfigurement from conditions, it could be from cancer, but neurological conditions, Bell's palsy, um, could be from a car accident, those type of things. But we found that with cancer patients, we started partnering with other nonprofits and we realized all the things that you guys have been talking about, the emotional piece of it, um, trying to navigate through the system, being a patient and not having any understanding about healthcare or case management or being how to advocate for yourself and all these things. So um, I have a clinical um, psychologist that works along with me to help patients. So we've been reaching out to um, healthcare systems in our area. In, I live in Pittsburgh and um, to try to help their patients because it's how do you fill out and look at, you know, long-term disability, how you look at social security disability to help with the financial, what kind of programs are out there to help them with, uh, which I did find a HEMAP program to help me in with my mortgage, what kind of resources are available in the community. And so it's also um, overwhelming, like where to go. And if you're living that moment, you have no idea like how to navigate through that. So like we've been connecting with patients and healthcare providers um, and, basically we're being overwhelmed but um that's okay um we're just going to try to continue to get funding because what we are doing i know is very important we mm -hmm. do we have a platform called council where we go in and we do an assessment of the patient we look at you know it's holistic it's mind body spirit it's not one component and it's actually just not about the patient it's about the caregiver mm -hmm. and so we look at that whole thing we help them we figure out where they are what things are important to them how we can navigate through that case management is it getting them dme equipment is it navigating or collaborating with their healthcare provider is it when they're in the facility and they don't really know what to do when they're going to be discharged so it's like taking them taking the whole experience and like my background and what I did for myself is actually now helping other people. And then Adrian, mm -hmm. the counseling component, the depression, anxiety, the PTSD, all this stuff that happens. And we're even assisting healthcare providers because we know that losing patients is a difficult thing. So she does debriefing with them as well. So mm -hmm. we looked at that and we're trying to make this model. And we just connected with one of my physicians who is in New York and Long Island that wants to work with us because he knows this mental health component and what that we're doing is something that's lacking. Um, so we're going to be working with them uh, to help with, with that process. That's incredible. That's amazing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for taking your own journey and really turning that outwards and creating such a robust uh, experience for others. Well, Yes, I mean, I think all of us that are in healthcare, um, we like helping people. And then when that piece of me stopped, I felt like a, a huge part of me was gone. So I just kept thinking, like, what could I do? And when a physician said, you know, you need to start a support group, I'm like, I am in no place, no way, no how to actually help someone else, but I am like struggling myself, you know? And he's like, I really think this will help you. 
Mm-hmm. And it did. Like I found this was a secret to my healing was uh, helping other people and giving back. And if my journey can help one person or, you know, m- more than that, I am so happy about that. And then I've learned that, you know, I put my faith in God and he helps navigate me through all these challenges. And this is my new mission. Like mm-hmm. me being able to give back and helping others is kind of like what I'm, why I'm here. So I was excited and thank you guys for doing this. When I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, I want to learn more about this. And how can I, how can we use what you guys are teaching to actually help our patients as well? So thank you. Okay. Awesome, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, Pamela. You now get to listen to my beagle bark as somebody's delivering something. Um, Karen. My story is similar to yours in that when I first was diagnosed, I'm sorry, he's just going to keep barking. Um, That's okay. He's cute. All dogs welcome. (laughs) When I was first diagnosed in 2008, the first time, um, I was a writer. I was writing um, for a marketing company and I developed aphasia, meant I Mm therapy I lost my ability to remember my nouns which really made it difficult to write so um so I literally was sitting at home feeling very sorry for myself I was bald I was puppy from the steroids and I was unemployed I couldn't do my job anymore and then I just I I just had one of those moments I was like get out of the house go figure this out I ended up at the hobby store where I picked up little bird houses and I started painting them. I'm not a painter. My, my um, background is in theater and music. Um, but I started painting bird houses and I started giving them away to other newly diagnosed cancer patients. So along the way, I discovered two things. One, um, like Karen said, when you're doing something for someone else, it just makes your journey and, and makes you feel better. And also that you can't really be sad when you're painting little birdhouses. So it's just impossible. Um, From that in 2010, so we've been doing this now for almost 11 years. In 2010, Living Proof Exhibit was founded. And we provide the therapeutic benefits of the arts to people touched by cancer. Mm. Not just the patients, not just the survivors, but family members and caregivers. Everything that we do is free to the people, so funding. Um, But I just yesterday recorded um, a presentation for the Iowa Public Health Conference. And I think we're going to be the only people there that don't have MD or, you know, art nurses. And it was us, our partners at the symphony, our partners at the museum, our partners at the writing center, our partners at the botanical center. That's how diverse our programming is. And the idea for us to make this presentation is to get people thinking about how they can use the arts to improve the quality of life of their patients. We're very lucky here. We are in both of our hospitals. They're very supportive of us. We partner with Gilda's Club. We partner, we're partnered up in Chicago because of Livestrong. Um, we have a uh, connection uh, partnership in New York. We have now have a partnership up in Chicago um, that we met at the last conference. So we have four main programs. I invite you all because we are in the hospitals. We are able to make those connections to say that um, not only do the arts help with the psychosocial uh, aspects of cancer care, but also there is a literal connection between participating in the arts and the reduction of cortisol and the improvement in your immune system. And I have research. Um, So I am more than happy to share any of that. Livingproofexhibit.org is our um, website and happy to share that because I just think that we all need, it's not just um, Karen, my last cancer completely changed my body. And I'm, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm nodding. Nobody prepared me for that. Thankfully, I had the tools, but nobody on the medical side prepared me for it. So I think I'm um, thank you so much, everybody, for doing this. I think we're all going to learn. Thank you. Thank you for what you said. Um, it's interesting because one of the 
one of the things that I try to help people with is re, re, um, re exploring or examining themselves to moving forward, you know, because we get stuck and things that we were able to do before. Like I used to play trumpet, I can't do that anymore. So the things I did before, like, uh, like you said, you have to figure out now what can I do? And it gives you the opportunity to explore those things. And arts and music are the one of the things like painting and listening. Um, did you learn in school? Yeah. Um, and those type of things I think is very important because you're retapping into something else and redefining yourself, so to speak. So I, I applaud what you're doing and thank you. And our services are free as well. So, but thank right. you. There's already some like important themes developing, I think around arts, right? Around using our own experience around, um, yeah. And I, I, I uh, thought, is it loose? Lutz? They said that right. Yes, it is. Okay, you want to share also? Hi. Yes. Um, yeah, um, I want to share of, of what it is that brought me to uh, to you guys. Um, my son was diagnosed with leukemia when he was two years old, and uh, that led me to work with a specific population. He is twenty, gosh, twenty one years post survivor, but uh, with many residual health issues. He's 23 right now, graduated from college. Um, you know, he just got his first job after graduation during the pandemic. So, uh, but I had the chance to experience firsthand uh, a lot of families struggling, uh, being caregivers, for children with cancer. So that led me to work for the Millionaires Foundation. We are located in San Diego, California. And um, what we do is that we provide various programs to help these families navigate through their child's journey with cancer. Uh, our main program is transportation. But also, so we provide free transportation for these kids to any medical appointment they may need. But I am pursuing a project and I will need resources. Uh, I would like to create a transition program, which is uh, we notice that when, when the kids reach uh, 18 or sometimes 21, they are transferred from the pediatric hospital to an adult hospital where the resources are scarce, where they are, uh, where the doctors are directed to talk to the child, adult, instead of the parents, where these kids uh, struggle from transportation, mental health, uh, probably learning disabilities, many other health issues. So we would like to be able to find resources for these families, especially the parents. Uh, that and 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 probably many of you know that when a child is diagnosed with cancer, the whole family gets sick. Siblings are left with other caregivers, uh, school uh, health. There's there's so many issues. So we would like to to well, I am in pursuing and and to create a program that it will help these kids transition and to be able to help themselves take care while they are continuing uh, dealing with this side effects, long lasting side effects of childhood cancer. Um, so I, I, I believe that, you know, this is a critical population. Until recently, there was not many resources when it comes to scholarship for cancer survivors, when there, is, there were so many things because these are cancer survivors that turn into adults and we would like to pursue a quality of life for them that sometimes, uh, the, 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 the statistics shows that, you know, uh, it is dealing probably the rest of their life with so many side effects. Uh, speaking personally, uh, my son has a metabolic syndrome, he has diabetes, he has an osteochondrosis syndrome, and we continue seeing like 10 specialists after so many years. And, and, and thank God, you know, he has a good support but I see other children where the parents don't even send their kids to school. Mm -hmm. uh, we see other children that have so many learning disabilities and that you know, school is probably not an option. Mm -hmm. So um, 
and talking about mental health, it's so crucial. It's so crucial. And, and I, I appreciate you guys giving the opportunity to open this forum. And I look forward uh, you know, to stay connected, to, to get resources and see how we can help these, this very fragile population. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you to the three of you for pulling out some really important threads here already for patients, children, and adults. The, the arc, right, that it's not just the crisis of the moment, but the ongoingness and the chronicity, the families, the providers, um, and these ideas on, on arts and um, uh, transportation and, and so many of these pieces. So I'm going to turn this over to, to Becca to kind of deepen this step farther here. Thanks, Zena. Thanks, everyone. So we're getting a little bit of an idea from what you guys have shared already about the current state, some of the challenges in how cancer psychosocial care. Is everyone familiar when I use the word psychosocial, does that word ring a bell? You can like yet nod or give me a thumbs up or an emoji. Cool. Um, also, as we go, feel free if you have something else to add, you can drop it into the chat as we go too, because we're going to save this chat. So it's a really great way for us to capture a lot of your ideas as well. So just putting that out there that we can communicate by talking, by using our expressions, our emojis, and by putting things into the chat as well. Um, so what we'd like to do now is move a little bit from this idea of what isn't working, what are the problems towards future state. So put on your, your brainstorming or your blue sky dream cap with us. And we are going to dream up some ways and examples of how this psychosocial or mental health care could be delivered so that we're optimizing well being for patients and loved ones. So, what could this integrated, comprehensive psychosocial care look like in actuality? And then, Zena and my job here as moderators is going to be to help us dream big and then maybe bring back some realism to the conversation as well because Zena obviously works for an organization that provides mental health care for professionals working in cancer care. And I have a cancer clinic that I see oversee the day-to-day -day operations. And I see patients come in the doors every single day. And then I see our providers struggle with figuring out how to meet the needs of those patients. So we wanna be able to create some solutions here for Live Strong that are um, usable in everyday life. So we wanna dream and then we wanna ground in reality. So thinking about this, optimized care, right? So put on your dream hat. Where, when, how is the patient introduced to this idea of psychosocial care? In an ideal setting. Thanks guys. Um, let's start with, I saw Karen's hand. I saw Pamela's hand. Let's start with, oh, we said Jesse. You know what? I'll come back to you ladies. Let's welcome some new voices if that's okay. And we'll come back. And everyone, let's try and keep our, our um, comments brief so we can hear from everybody. So Jesse, let's start with you. So I'm in an enviable position as I started a psycho oncology program at a fairly large cancer center on Long Island. Um, and they're really supportive of me thinking out of the box um, or doing things that hadn't been done before. So for example, one of the things I'm working on is universal depression screening um, in our patients at every single visit. Mm -hmm. um, so your mental health is addressed. It's a two question, possibly not if anyone knows a PHQ um, kind of survey. Um, that, um, and more than anything else is to normalize the conversation. Um, and that this is something that needs to be introduced all the time. So it's not just your, um, you know, how's your nausea doing? How is your sleep? How is your pain? How is your mental health? Um, and that really is kind of my goal. And I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate that I work at a place that supports that. And, you know, I had a surgeon come to me and say, what if we looked at meditation and right, like really fun stuff going on? Yes. Uh, but you know, the way it gets introduced is also difficult because it people are coming in not only with the provider's understanding of mental health and and possible stigmas against it, um, but the patient or that person's experience too. And one of the things that I'm trying to figure out is how do I word things in a way that's really relatable for people and feel comfortable um, so that we can introduce those things. But in terms of dreaming big, it's great. I sit, my office is in the treatment room waiting area. Um, it's about as center as it can be. I say hi to people in the hallway. And so people get referred to me, they're like, oh, I've seen you before. Um, so they, I mean, they can't see my face now because I wear a mask, but um, 
<laughs> they know my face. I think those kinds of things of really just being there of um, and having that part of it can it just makes a difference. Um, I, I have more, you know, referrals and I know what to do with sometimes. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would love to hire more people right now, but uh, beyond that, but also look, I'm looking for suggestions of like, how do we word these things to people? It's, it's really accepting and warm and inviting. Yes. I heard you say a bunch of things that were really important in terms of how do we introduce the idea. So one, co-location. The psychosocial support is there in the treatment center area so that everyone sees and knows that it's there, that it's accessible, that you're being friendly and introducing people to the idea that this isn't something scary. You're saying hi, you're building relationships with people, right? And that you're doing screening. The PHQ is a tool we use it as well for depression with every patient as much as possible at least once, right? Or maybe multiple times so that you're able to have this way of looking at all patients and getting a quick snapshot of what they're going through. And I think that screening like that is a great tool. Um, so yeah, lots of incredible ideas here. Um, I don't wanna call out on anybody. I saw Tiffany nodding though, quite a bit. And I was just curious if you're thinking something as you were nodding and then we'll come back to Karen and Pamela who also had some comments. I just personally resonated with the piece of normalizing these conversations, especially addressing the stigma, at least from my experience personally, with my mom. Um, she's a stage four can breast cancer survivor. And, you know, even for me, I, you know, ended up seeking out therapy for myself. But also when I brought it up to my mom, it was really difficult for her because she was, you know, for her, it's almost acknowledging that, you know, there is an, an, a problem. Um, yes. And so she was really against the idea. She's like, I don't need um, these conversations. And even for me, she wasn't that comfortable with me seeking out a therapist. So I just, um, I don't know. I just love that component of making it welcoming and just a part of a, like just a conversation that you would have with your healthcare provider. And it's not this stigma of like, oh, you know, mental, it's a mental health issue. And you would have, a, you don't like, you would only be seeking these resources if you have a problem, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so finding a way to introduce the idea gently to destigmatize it. So it's not like saying you need therapy, you're broken. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, right. yeah, I love that. I love that. Zena, go ahead. No, I was just thinking, you know, in, in the therapy world, we have a term sometimes that says predict the problem, right? We can lay the map out and say, this is part of what happens. It's totally, you know, and, and it may, it may not, but then when it comes up, if it comes up and we're like, oh, right, they said that maybe I'd have some feelings around this or maybe, right? And it's not other or separate, right? It's like, if you're at this terrible point, then you go over there to that person in a totally different place, you know? It's like really that integration, normalization, yeah, friendly, like, I heard that word. And what if in your very first visit, your oncologist or someone was to say to you, you know what, it is so normal to be scared, anxious, um, you know, worried about death, worried about your relationships. And if, you know, and that's a normal thing to have. Like that in and of itself, one, one minute sentence predicting the problem, I think could go a long way. So yeah, um, so like I said, present it as a form of self-care. Mm -hmm. Love that, right? Because sometimes yeah. languaging gets a little freaky, right? People are like mental health components. Like, oh, as you're caring for yourself, you're nourishing yourself here. You know, might want to breathe or do some visualization. Here's some ideas or something like that. Self-care, yeah. So it's not so scary and unapproachable. Um, I want to come back to Karen and then Pamela and Debbie. I saw your hand up as well. So hold on to that thought. We'll come back to you. But Karen, go ahead. Um, I love these ideas because I think um, it's very important. We do the P PHQ as well because mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure we're, they are where they are. And I, um, we talked to healthcare providers about you know introducing us at the very beginning. But every because of all the information they receive, it's often very overwhelming. So they may have heard of our name and they may have know a little bit about what we do, but I think it's because of all the information they received and they just kind of like put it off, you know, put it off to the side. And mm -hmm. it's like a tool they use to come back to if they actually feel like they need it. And oftentimes, even though they need it, they don't recognize it in themselves. So I think it's being able to be introduced not only at the first appointment, but um, having them do the PHQ and then if there's any changes, I think that's when they need to say, you know, maybe you can reach out to, you know, a therapist or, you know, face-to-face -face healing to see, because we do try to put them in touch with someone, you know, now it's, now it's virtual, so it's not a big deal, 
but we try to put some, you know, if we get um, contacted from someone outside of where we are, we yeah. probably put them in touch with someone in their area, you know what I mean, that they can actually speak with. So, but yeah, I love those ideas. And um, I think that would have been helpful even for myself, you know, sure. um, but being a nurse, I think that we are the often times like the stigma of being depressed or being, you know, um, or having anxiety, that type of thing. But yeah, normalizing it, I think would be a great um, piece of it. Awesome. Thank you. Pamela, let's come back to you. Sorry, my brain is just like, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I was diagnosed four different times. Never did anyone as fabulous as Jesse reach out to me um, in four different diagnoses. So big picture, that what Jesse has in her, what Jesse has, we need everywhere. We need to have, um, when I see the oncologist and they might send me to a nutritionist, they need to send me to somebody to, who I can just talk to. Um, every community deals with cancer differently. I'm listening to Tiffany talk about her, her mom's stigma of not wanting to you know, talk to someone. It's, so we need to be, we need to have a diverse approach to this in different communities. Um, listen and absorb cancer care differently, mental health care differently. Um, I like that self-care. Uh, we have found that a lot of times our creative sessions, what happens is people who didn't talk, um, perhaps we held a session for grief and anecdotally, there was a young girl who processed her grief through her art. And she, she had not been able to do that previously. So layers to see what works for each individual, to see what works for each community. But for crying out loud, I would have loved to have somebody tell me that I needed to take um, time to grieve the loss of my body, to grieve the loss of everything that was going on. My doctors were concerned about keeping me alive and I'm very grateful. But Jesse, I wanna go hang out with you now. <laughs> That is a really powerful point, right? That there's often this disconnect between the interests of the medical oncology or the treatment team, med onc, radiation oncology, surgical oncology, and what the patient needs or what the psychosocial care providers can offer. And when they're not all on the same page and prioritizing mental health, we definitely have a problem, right? So um, Debbie, let's come over to you. Yeah, um, I know that, that the folks at Livestrong probably know about cancer support community, um, but I don't know if the, if other people do. It's a, an organization that's built around everything that we're talking about here, providing holistic psychosocial support for cancer patients, survivors, and everyone that surrounds them, caregivers, family members, and that sort of thing. And um, we've got like um, 150 locations throughout the country, a couple in Canada and elsewhere, but um, uh, as some of those are in hospital locations and some are freestanding uh, centers like where I work in Columbus, Ohio. But one of the, um, one of the great aspects about this organization is headquartered in Washington is actually in Philly. We have a, um, a research institute that has created a uh, a, a validated tool, distress screening tool um, that is called Cancer Support Source. And it helps uh, people put a, uh, just kind of get a, get a grip on what are the, the things that are causing the distress. Um, and, uh, and then we use it with a social worker who then puts together a care plan after the fact to, to help uh, um, explain what what the results are and what kinds of programs which we provide um, are appropriate. So whether it's just individual counseling um, or uh, support groups or healthy eating programs and nutrition and yoga and just a ton of different uh, different types of things. But um, it's uh, <coughs> the one of the results that we've found in doing these distress screenings is that that I forget what the percentage is, but uh, we have a pretty high percentage of people, probably close to 80%, who feel that just completing the survey before they even get the results 
is a verification or, or kind of a validates the fact that, oh, that's why I'm feeling this way. Oh, yeah. it's okay. Maybe that's part of this, you know, maybe that's what other people are feeling too, before you even get the results of it. So that's one thing. And then um, we also find that the caregivers have more distress related to the cancer journey than, than uh, patients in, in many cases, not mm -hmm. always, but some, you know, there are a lot of those situations. Um, so um, I, I know somebody was mentioning, maybe Pamela, you said that you partnered with uh, Gilda's Club. Um, we're part of, Gilda's Club is part of Cancer Support Community. So anybody who's in a city where there's a Gilda's Club or a Cancer Support Community, I would suggest that you reach out to that organization and partner in some way. If you're part of the, these other caregiving organizations like Karen's and and others, um, you know, there we have a lot of interest in, in reaching more people with cancer. Um, and I could <clears throat> talk a long time about this, but one, one thing um, about where the first introduction happens, mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite some time ago, Cancer Support Community has been around for <coughs> 40 years or so, but, um, and all built on the idea that that community uh, and, and support from others um, really helps people through the journey and, and results truly in empowering people to, to manage their own journey. Patient, mm -hmm. um, patient active concept is the, is the model that we use. So in, instead of just letting somebody else tell you, here's what you should do, you, you need to manage your, your journey yourself. But <laughs> when um, our organization used to have a lot of, or of uh, locations within hospitals, um, that um, the patient, once they're finished with treatment and is not going into the hospital often, um, is not as excited about going back to the hospital for programs. So it's not just identifying the, the distress or the need, but then it's re addressing those things through, through programming um, that I mentioned before. So that was one issue. Then our organization kind of moved away from having things, having facilities inside of hospitals and now it's kind of going back to that where we've got a mix a good mix because it is a you know the treatment areas are of course good places you, you kind of have a captive audience when people are going through treatment you know it's yeah. an opportunity to have a nice friendly interaction um, with people so we part in, in Columbus don't have we have a relationship with one hospital where we do a support group inside the hospital um, but, and, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, we've also found that um, our number one, well, our number one source of referrals for getting people into our programming is through friends and family. But the number two is through nurse navigators. And I know there was a, just a yeah. comment, I think Rebecca may, uh, maybe said that, you know, it'd be great if the, if the oncologist could just say, hey, you need to take some time to care about yourself, but that's not going to happen because doctors don't spend that kind of time, unfortunately, and they probably don't want to, and they're not trained well in understanding the, the psychological impact and the need. They're just not. So, you know, that might be a huge barrier, a huge mountain to climb, not that you shouldn't try, but um, we found that nurse navigators and mostly nurse navigators. I mean, all hospitals have social workers, but um, the nurse navigators job is to help people navigate the system. And they're the ones that we get calls from all the time. You know, so-and-so wants to know, do you have a support group for this? Yes, let's get it together. So um, that's just my two cents. And again, I'd encourage everybody to look into cancer support community because there's a ton of resources for you. And I put a note into the chat, Debbie, that if you can drop in a link to the um, validated screening tool, Cancer Support Source, and if there's any information on your website about that, that'd be great so that we can track that and share that with everybody. Um, yeah. And KK, I love your comment about at Livestrong, we think about basically different recommendations, so how to personalize care for a patient for emotional support, depending on what they need. And some people aren't interested in psychotherapy, right? For some people, like as Tiffany was saying, for her mom, that was not an option. She was not even open to that idea. So I'm curious, and also I'd love to hear some new voices if you haven't shared yet and you've been wanting to share. Um, uh, I'm curious, how can we 
ensure that we're delivering this care, psychosocial care, in a way that supports each patient's unique preferences and values? What platforms, tools, technologies, or other um, methods can we use to make sure that we're meeting patients where they're at if they're not comfortable with something that's more traditional? What do you guys think? I can kick us off um, since I made that comment. <laughs> um, I mean, at Livestrong, when people call in to our navigation program, um, they may directly identify that they're looking to find some social emotional support, but it doesn't always happen as you all have described in your circumstances at your organizations. Um, a lot of the times I'll listen to them talk and I, I can tell that this person would benefit from social emotional support or, you know, especially if they're like a caregiver, and they need to some caregiving themselves. Um, so when we have that conversation with them, um, I try to introduce it as, would you be interested in this? Um, and then I also say, you know, there's like peer to peer matching, which is a great form of social emotional support. We have our Live Strong at the YMCA program, you know, which is an exercise group, but that's another form of social emotional support, you know, exercising or being with people who've gone through the same type of experience as you can really boost your morale um, and make you feel better. So we just try to have the conversation and it, you know, we're not um, social workers at Livestrong. Um, we're just um, navigators in the sense that we have lots of resources we've compiled and we can help you navigate those. Um, but, you know, presenting it in that way, like we, we've all said in that humanizing way um, so, you know, what, what works for you? Would you love to go on like a two week adventure in the outdoors with cancer survivors? Cause that's a real thing. You know, we can offer you that and help you get connected with that. So just being open to what, um, the survivor wants and needs. Um, and sometimes that just means making more recommendations than the basic recommendations, um, to see what fits, um, what works for them. That's awesome. KK. Thanks. And Karen, oh, I saw your hand go up. Oh, Zena, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm envisioning this buffet, right? It's like, here's this and this and this and like, okay, do you like chocolate cake or do you like broccoli? You know, most people, well, I shouldn't, poor broccoli gets a bad rap, but you know, <laughs> like, but there's some people, me, that's like, yes, broccoli, you know? So some people might really go for that, but having this like full spectrum of options there. And some of them are like, sneaky options, right? And not in a manipulative way, but it's just the entry point that doesn't look like mental health <laughs> treatment, right? Um, love that. Uh, yeah, that just got me all excited. Karen? I love that too. Um, I think it should be a smorgasbord. I look at uh, um, like a logic, you know, you have the hub as the patient and then you look at all the different things can actually help the patient. Um, and I think the biggest thing is some of us are doing some of these things. I, I think it's for a patient, it's overwhelming because they don't know where to go. So I think if it's more consistency um, in regards to uh, all the different options that are available to an individual um, and making sure that like healthcare providers are aware of all the different options, so to speak. And I agree that physicians are not necessarily gonna be the ones that make those decisions. I know that I speak with a lot of uh, nurse practitioners or PAs that do referrals to me for patients um, because they've seen them in the office. And they said, you know, hey, we've noticed that they're very depressed, you know, can you reach out? Or we noticed that, you know, they may need some assistance and resources, you know, can you reach out? So we do a lot with that. But I was thinking um, also an app, you know, doing an app um, for cancer patients. I know there are other um, places that do have apps, but like having one specific app that can be tailored um, because now everyone's using social media or apps, you know, right? That to can actually, because kids can use it, you know, like what if this is what's going on, what are the different choices? And they can kind of um, do that. And they, and then we can have them explore with their physician or the provider, like the different things as well. So I, th that was just an, um, an option or opinion that I had too. So, or feedback. I love that idea. I love that idea. I love that too. I'm so curious if you all, you know, had had an app or design an app, like what would you want to see on it? Let's take that question, Zena, and do like a really quick brainstorm jigsaw. So get to your keyboard 
And for the next 30 seconds or so, you guys, give it a little bit of thought. We're gonna ask everyone to engage with Zena's question. If there was an app that could help provide you the kind, any kind of emotional support, well-being at the beginning of your journey or in the middle of your treatment, what would you want out of it? And you can be specific or you can be broad. How to find what is available near me. That's awesome, KK. Great start. Yeah, cool. Like a location tool that yeah. then could like populate what was near to you. It's a great idea. Physical versus social versus emotional options. That's great. Mm, yeah, like buckets. To connect with other cancer survivors similar to what I'm going through. So peer support, but to sort of weed out like who's got a similar experience to me. Yeah, almost like a, like, like sub groups like chat groups kind of like a group like Facebook group option for yeah with like a built-in matching algorithm and I know like grit health is a great app for young adults and it does that mm -hmm. sort of what Intermittent Angels does um through their manual caregivers support groups awesome ludes yeah beautiful and then Jesse said pictures of the people we talk to like program directors so it seems more human and less distant yeah mm. like what if it wasn't just a picture, but it was like them with their kids or their pet or like a hobby, right? Like we're all humans. I think sometimes people are scared of their clinicians. They put them in this box, right. but like they have a life. Right? Yeah, like a, <laughs> yeah, a little gift. Here's my team. <laughs> and Robin said, instant connection to a provider or expert in real time for free or affordable, i.e. help managing and administering meds, onco massage, meditation. Like I need this thing right now click the go button and someone, a navigator would contact you and be like, Hey, I heard that you need help with, you know, getting, um, support for the cost of your medications. How can I help you? That would be amazing. Yeah. Caregiver support groups. Yeah, absolutely. So an app that would serve all, across the board, it sounds like, you know, you can choose if you're on the patient side, family member, provider, and it would kind of funnel you that direction to other people. Thank you. Understanding your healthcare team and what role they play in your care. Who do you need to talk to about what? Isn't that such a thing in businesses and stuff? It's like, I don't, I have this question, but who, I don't even know the person to bring this to. There's so many people. These are awesome. Things I can do physically. Oh, that would be neat, right? Like in there, there's a, a section that automatically propagates like take a breath or, hey, here's a puzzle or here's some quick ideas with stuff in your cupboard that you can make something. <laughs> Play-Doh at home, just to occupy your hands for a couple minutes. Yeah. Videos. Yes, I'm seeing some common threads around like mindfulness and meditation, but also if you need help now, whatever that help is like instant access, instant support, emergency lines, beautiful. This is so awesome. Kim, I love what you're saying, like the arc of the journey, right? And I think this is coming up. Other people are sharing too. There's like the acute stages, right? And then there's the ongoingness. And then there's once you're done with treatment, but you continue going on, right? And there's different things that are more commonly needed at different times in that journey, right? You might not be doing grief work day one when you're, you know, for some people it might filter in, but other people it's like safety, right? First and then we start to open that up. So something that can be additive and shift along the journey with where you're at. It's great. You guys, I think everyone here just collectively built an app and now we just need to tell Livestrong that we can find a way to go get it funded and get it built. I love it. Yeah. Um, 
We've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to transition back to Zena. We wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about the normalizing psychosocial care. So let's um, maybe jump into our, our last section here. Yeah, and this has already, you know, come up. So just to continue to flesh this out, right, this normalization piece um, for, for everyone, sounds like, right? Oncologists, payers, insurance, that's a piece of it, right? Um, family, patients themselves with kids, all of that, you know? So um, we realize that this normalization piece is so key. So what do you think are some parts of this that could help with that? help even make this okay? Is it the languaging? Is it the who it's coming from? I mean, people have mentioned some different pieces of this, but what do we think? What could help in terms of this normalization process? An app. <laughs> We sort of have a normalization and implementation. And I know you guys that when we think about normalization, like for me, Zina and I were chatting about this in advance. One of the things that I thought of was like right away was the infrastructure. There's organizations that uh, do accreditation to make sure that cancer centers all have a certain amount of psychosocial care and support on hand, right? But that only goes so far um, because like you're saying, providers, may not even be trained. So provider training might be another way that we can normalize this, right? Um, how can we maybe doing some sort of advocacy so that the payers can start talking about this and reimburse for mental health care? And that might be a systemic way. So just to get your, your juices flowing there with a couple of thoughts. What else? Providing CEs for providers, Karen. Yeah, yeah. So coming from the system, right? Yeah, um, love Sandy said an app for men. No, right. So there's certain like subpopulations, mm -hmm. right? And that peer to peer piece of normalizing there. Well, I think the app, like you can put on there, it's a subgroup, like you have, if someone's looking for specifically women or someone's looking for women or someone's looking for children you know like under the age of or young adults is another piece of this i think they uh -huh. have challenges with having kids um different challenges in regards to maybe infertility and all those different things that are going along with that so i think that would be great to kind of you know what age group are you in so to speak and then kind of like see what kind of problems they and then they want to do subgroups after that but um having the ability to do have webinars or have the ability, hey, do you need an individual counselor to schedule a meeting, have the option on there, you know, um, on the app. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to um, do wellness, some, you know, you can have something that is done either weekly that, you know, you're doing a yoga or maybe daily, I don't know, um, maybe daily would be good or three times a week, but where they can actually log in, they know exactly what time yoga is going to be, they can log, log in or they can do live or they can go back to it at a later time. It'll be like recorded. Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing with support groups, be on there. Um, have a talk with a nutritionist, have a talk with a physician, have a talk with a social worker. Um, these are just ideas because this is kind of like what I wanted to do with an app. Of course, we don't have the money to do it, but these are the things that I was thinking of to have it more engaging, interactive because you don't, when you're in that space of, of having cancer, you're in that space and you can't get out of that what if, or this is happening and you're trying to struggle with getting treatment with, you know, and you're exhausted. So if you have an opportunity to, to go and take yourself out of that space, it's kind of like why I started face to face to see other stories of hope and inspiration, to see other people that have actually gone through it. And then, um, then as you go, you may not use all of the app, you may use pieces of the app. And then as you get further into it, you know, you have different phases, like the beginning, the middle, and then you have survivorship. So all these different mm -hmm. things I think would be helpful on the app. That's just my. Yeah, that was oh. like a beautiful brainstorm. Just watching your brain do that, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> was... I've, li I've been living it. And like most of us that are living it, even the caregivers, like I wish there would have been something from my mom. 
she was, you know, when she was there with me and trying to support me, she was like overwhelmed and didn't, didn't know how to, didn't know any questions asked. Me being a nurse, at least, I thank God I did not lose my brain, you know, and I was able to like think and keep my myself through this. Mm-hmm. But if I had, then who would have been there to support my mom? You know what I mean? So I, I'm just looking at, it's a ripple effect. It's that my child, my son would have, it would have been nice to have like a support group for the children of people with cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, It'd be nice to have for like family members, you know, how do we, like my brother would say to me or ask me questions. I would get very upset or they would, I think it's helping people understand why people maybe avoid you, why people say the things they say maybe trying to teach them how to say things differently or approach things differently. So they're not causing angst or um, more anxiety for the individual going through cancer. Like for me, they would say, you're beautiful. Well, I didn't feel beautiful. You can tell me I'm beautiful until I'm blue in the, or you're blue in the face, or it's like talking to that wall. I am not going to get it. I have to change my mindset. And by you saying that, all you're doing is making me mad, or at least you're alive. Well, don't tell me that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so just like in like all these different, you said ripple out, right? But like all these different aspects, if we can think of specific things for that group of people that can just, again, predict what's so common, give some ideas, right? What's helpful, what's not as helpful, like, and just that is part of the normalization. Um, forgot who said just even taking like the a depression inventory just says, oh, <laughs> even just taking it, right? Mm-hmm. Points us yeah. in that direction. Um, also yeah. really appreciate uh, Sandy and Pamela, this, and somebody <laughs> mentioned earlier, like when we're in treatment, there's that captive audience, right? People already there for hours. So occupying that with things that are already helpful emotionally, <laughs> spiritually, additive to that side for whoever is there, the patient, the family, right? While they're in the space, that's really um, neat too. I love what you said, Karen, about um, ensuring that people understand how to talk to others who have been diagnosed with cancer or caregivers, right? So maybe there's some element of that as well. Like, hey, um, you've just been diagnosed or for, for loved ones, like, hey, tips for how to talk to, or for community, tips for how to talk to your friends who are just diagnosed with cancer. Things to say, things not to say, right? Um, but this idea of interesting, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I I was just thinking too, while while I was listening to folks, um, we're talking a lot about like coming from the cancer community and normalizing the mental health aspects and whatnot. But I think it's also interesting. I think just like the regular population, right. And where things just show up to normalize cancer there, (laughs) right? Like if there's yoga studio that has a yoga for cancer survivors class, that just is like normalizing for the whole population. And then, you know, that, oh yeah, this is, you know, great. Um, and so coming from that side too. Yeah. I teach one of those. I love it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Luz? I like that because, um, I think with some cancer patients in the beginning of their journey, you know, they're tired from the radiation or the chemo. And so even just keeping them active, even if it's just for 15 minutes, you know what I'm saying? Doing something. And, um, but then now, you know, some cancer patients, depending on where their cancer was, they have limitations now. They can't do certain things. And like, you have to modify, you know, um, like yoga or um, Tai Chi or those type of things. So anyway. I would like to add the fact that, I mean, I'm going to come again, and I apologize, from the pediatric population, and we're dealing with parents, and uh, especially we work with underserved families, and uh, a lot of uh, refugees, so Hmm. we not only have a language barrier, we have a cultural barrier. They will not go to a Tai Chi class. They will not go to yoga. They will not participate on support groups. So I was mentioning to, I don't know if you go by the name of KK, uh, that we created a needing program. 
And it was so successful because it was not a support group, but it was a support group. The parents will come. We had grandparents, dad, sit down there to knit, just simple knit. And that's when the burbage will come out, right? And then uh, we had an incredible, we, that this was before the pandemic. So what I'm trying to say, I mean, all these things are, are incredible, but also we have to be very community sensitive with the population that we're working with, the population that we're trying to 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 uh, to reach out. So uh, you know, uh, if we're talking again, going back to the app, it will have to be in different languages, and we have to include things that these families can and and are willing to do, and it's easy for them. Uh, if I introduce to to um, to uh, African refugee yoga, probably it's not something that they're gonna get find appealing, but maybe painting, maybe other things and, and to be able uh, to offer this because I believe that the recovery of a child with cancer, it's 90%. Uh, based on the well-being of the parents. Uh, mm -hmm. We spend 24 hours in a hospital, little sleep, probably worrying about so many things. And I always uh, remember to tell my son, and I always, he was the reflect, his, his daily emotional being uh, was the reflection of my emotional being. One mm -hmm. day he saw me crying and he said, oh, I think I'm going to die because you're crying. I was like, mm. okay. So I think that we, we deal with a different population than the cancer survivors, because the caregivers to me are the ones that are the cancer survivors uh, when we talk about a child. Absolutely. So um, it's many things that we need to take into consideration. And, and I love this group and I love all the ideas. So uh, please keep them coming because it's, it's uplifting. Yes, and thank you so much for that. I volunteered for uh, a few years in Colorado with the organization that provided care packages for the siblings of the child that was going through because the focus goes so much to the, the child that's in, in care and rightly so. And yet there's other family members there, right? Siblings that um, could use <laughs> that attention and love and, and, then, and food, just food for the families, right? Like the knitting, yes. we get all fancy, but saying, oh, let's have a meal together. Here's some mm -hmm. food and whoever wants to come, right? It's that connect, those connection points that are so nourishing emotionally and socially. The children receive so much support, support in ways of things that make them happy in the hospital, toys, uh, visitations from celebrities, more toys, blankets, hats, and, and we forget about the rest of the family. So our programs yeah. are tailored to take care of the family as a whole. We have a adopt a family program during Christmas mm -hmm. and the whole family is included. The whole family okay. gets the same options that the child gets. And, and it's really sad because when we ask the parents, what would you like for Christmas? They go like, no, I want something for my child. And I said, how do you think your child feels when they see everybody open presents and mom and dad are looking from the sideline? So I think those are the, the most important things when we talk about a cancer. So we all refer to being a, a, a provider, a care provider for, for these people that have to deal with this on a daily basis. So uh, yeah, like I said, love all the ideas, taking notes and, and thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. So um, not sure where actually, Becca, do you know where we are on our timeline? Because <laughs> this clock that's ticking down, I don't know that that's accurate. I'm checking. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're, are, are we at time, KK? We had until 1230. We were on the meeting hold, but I am messaging my team right now just to double check. Okay, I think we were we had um, an hour and 15 minutes so we're right at time now, um, and I know you guys that we could go on talking forever and maybe we'll need another follow up conversation. Um, so many amazing ideas. Yeah, really appreciate your your experience your heart. Right, what you have already created and are creating we genuinely wish you all the best with all of that and also for like contributing to each other and to this for Livestrong so that we can continue to brainstorm forward here too. Um, but got some really, especially awesome ideas about this app and also the accessibility parts of it, right? Um, uh, and 
how to look at the entire like arc of treatment, giving that kind of buffet kind of feeling because it's going to be different for each person, for each family member, for each provider, what resonates, what doesn't resonate, right? Um, so it sounds like the, the more options, the merrier, right? And um, to get really creative because it, uh, and also simple sometimes, right? Like knitting, <laughs> right? Having a meal together, uh, giving a gift or a word of advice. It can be so helpful moving together, right? Um, so uh, those are some of the things that popped for me in this conversation that I look forward to bringing, bringing back um, or forward uh, through Live Strong. Um, the arts also, that's been a big theme today. Thank you all for highlighting that aspect uh, as well. And this normalization, right? From that, that first meeting, right? Uh, we just have people there and say like, yeah, this is, this is so normal. <laughs> Pretty care. Um, anything else pop out for you, Becca? I think that we generated a lot of great ideas. And again, so Karen, you asked, are we going to do this again? I would defer to KK for that, uh, to answer that question. In terms of wrap up from today, all these ideas are going to be shared with the leadership at Live Strong Foundation. And then it sounds like there's going to be some communication back to this group about what happens next with these ideas and how they can be used to perhaps inform a funding opportunity for pilot projects to do some of the things that you guys just mentioned. So um, thank you for letting us be your, your co-hostesses um, in this really amazing conversation. Thank you for sharing your energy, your time, and um, KK will pass it over to you. Yeah, um, thanks everyone for joining today. This was such a great group. You know, we launched this series last year and it's really taken off and we're excited to really talk about solutions in 2021. I think everyone feels the same as me. We were pent up in our houses in 2020 and talking about what we we're gonna do. Um, and now we really get that opportunity to take it a step further. Um, as far as sessions throughout the year, we will be offering different solution sessions as well as icon sessions. Um, they will be on different topics. So as far as progressing this mental health conversation, um, we will be connecting everyone by sharing email addresses after this meeting. So there are opportunities to connect offline. And of course, Livestrong will take all this information and decide what icon series number three looks like now that we've had two conversations about this topic. Um, and I did get instructions from my team um, and we can, we can hang out till 12 or we can leave the room and leave the meeting. Um, but I think we just had a nice wrap up um, and I really appreciate you all coming and picking this room. It was really great. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, KK. Thank you so much.